Okay, so welcome everybody. Some of you know me, some of you don't. Um, I'm the newish director of the Initiative of Cities, along with my um, other director here, Catherine Lusk, and Stacey Fox, who's in the room as well, and David Gross, who's disappeared off outside. Um, so I've recently arrived, relatively well, recently, from the UK, and I've been on chair um, this afternoon session. Um, so, yeah. Um, one thing I will confess that in the 1980s, I was very much into punk music. So this is very much my kind of scene. So as a child of Thatcher's Britain and into like Susie and the Banshees and stuff like that. So this was a, a very exciting book to read. Right, so introductions. Okay, so Rodrigo Lopez de Barros is an assistant professor of Spanish, Portuguese and Latin American studies at BU. His book, Distortion and Subversion, Punk rock music and the protests for free public transportation in Brazil discusses the transformation of Brazil's traditional notions of urban space through a new social movement for free public transportation that was born out of the joining of Brazilian punk rock music and political militants. He's also, wait for this, an award winning filmmaker and writer for his documentary Chacal Forbidden to Write Poetry and his written work on Brazilian. Cuban cultures, respectively. So this is a kind of co-organized, I guess, um, event. So I'd also like to thank the Department of Romance Studies, the Department of Political Science, I don't know who's here from where, the City Planning and Urban Affairs Programme, the Centre for Latin American Studies, the Centre for the Humanities, and finally, last but not least, the Centre for Innovation and Social Science. So, wonderful book. This is going to be a great talk. So, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, of you came today for the book presentation. It's a great pleasure because I wrote this book actually during uh, my uh, uh, time here at PU. No, it was not uh, something that I adapted from my PhD dissertation. So I'm very glad to have the opportunity to be here and presenting uh, the book to you. I prepared uh, a, a like written presentation, which is uh, based on parts of the book that I arranged uh, together to make a kind of coherent uh, 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 text. Uh, so uh, my uh, I, in my book I work mainly with four uh, cities. Uh, I start in Salvador. Actually, my first chapter in the book is a chapter about uh, uh, the history of the early internet in Brazil because uh, uh, my book starts in 1996 and uh, the the early internet the the commercial internet in Brazil starts around 1995. So I write how these uh, hardcore punks and uh, the political militants uh, used to uh, use the internet to uh, for their own uh, interests, you know, uh, to, uh, to know about punk music, to uh, uh, disseminate their work, and also to organize political movements. Then I go to the city of Salvador because there in 2003, there was a revolt uh, called Revolta de Buzu Bus Revolt. Then there were, uh, that was a revolt against a fair hype there. Then there were two revolts in the city of Florianopolis in 2004 and 2005, which were also revolts against uh, uh, fair hypes. And then I go to the city of Belo Horizonte, where there was a, a, a very interesting uh, movement called uh, Carnaval Revolution, Revolution Carnival, which was an annual uh, meeting of, of punks, political militants that uh, used to uh, gather there to discuss to discuss several topics, including free public transportation. And then the book ends in Sao Paulo and the hardcore punk scene, uh, especially the straight edge punk scene. The straight edge punks are punks that uh, uh, don't drink alcohol, don't use drugs and are mostly vegans. 
and and I, I studied the relationship between them and the movement for free public transportation. So I will start uh, music transport ideas to bodies, buses transport bodies to ideas. In 1983, Sara Iacchini and Alberto Gieco released in Sao Paulo their documentary titled Funds. And you can see some stills from uh, the documentary here. Uh, early in the beginning of the film, the audience is establishing shots of the precarious favelas. Then a black man is registered washing himself with cold water, choosing to wear more conventional shoes instead of his combat boots and black leather jacket. He gets on the bus and arrives downtown. Walking anonymously in the city, the man looks for a job. Those scenes are counterposed with scenes of two other punks. They, in their turn, are outfitted properly as members of the early 1980s cultural and political punk movement. Pins, jackets, bracelets, belts. One of the two punks, is an office boy. His sequence is followed by the images of more punks, also employed as office boys in Brazil's economic heart. To accomplish their tasks, they go to the streets to catch municipal buses that carry them to businesses of several types. Walking, riding the bus, taking the train, these are the ways punks move through the metropolis. The punk experience is attached to modernity. In fact, an improbable descendant of modernism, punk constitute its most rebellious and at the same time most misunderstood uh, child. As Craig O'Hara points out, punk has enough similarities with the early 20th century European futurists that it becomes impossible not to make the association. Punks in the South American country could be the true unaware successors of Brazil's own 1920s modernism. Punk could likely be a more contemporary example of Oswald de Andrade's idea of anthropophagy, being culturally anthropophagic by nature, that is cannibalizing a foreign phenomenon and digesting and adapt it to the local reality. However, punk, although genetically genuine in its kinship to modernism, exists more like a rejected child, abandoned in the orphanage of utopias, an orphanage constructed by the pre-apocalyptic new liberal society in the 1970s and 1980s. One cannot negate that punk emanates from the center of imperialism, but it does so with a radical discourse that would incorporate a reaction to the decline of capitalist economy and the emergency and the emergence of new liberalism in the 1970s and 1980s. If one follows the arguments of several scholars, such as Rafael Lopes de Souza, Gustavo Steinmeier, and Alexander Dent. The same can be said for the music scene that followed in the 1990s and 2000s, when new liberalism further developed. Punk became a radical attempt at constructing democracy in a decreasingly democratic society. As stated in a 2000 album of the Sao Paulo hardcore band, Punk of No Return, you can see a photograph of a show of them uh, in the end of the 1990s in Sao Paulo, they say, quote, when we got involved with hardcore, we we're not attracted by lyrics and songs exhaustively shaped. What really interested us was the runners, the runners, the anger and the irony of punk. Dry lyrics and direct songs made the community extremely democratic, end of quote. It's remarkable, however, that with its violent noise-driven sound, punk does not break away from tonal music, neither in the production of Brazilian early punks from the 1970s and 1980s, nor in almost of the bands from the 1990s and 2000s as well. Punk is still within the hegemonic system of tonality. If the evolution of tonal music is related to the emergence 
of the bourgeoisie and capitalism, punk then is noise, noise occurring within the system. It attempts to disrupt capitalism from the inside of capitalism. It is at the same time disorder and subversion. If you adapt the words of Jacques Attali, I will quote him. More than colors and forms, it is sounds and the arrangements that fashion societies. With noise is born disorder and its opposite. The world with music is born power and its opposite, subversion. So the black man in that 19, 1983 documentary by Yakini and Dieco is the young Clemente from the band Innocentes, the Innocents. You can see a picture of him here. 30 years later, in 2013, the group would release a, an album called Sob Controle, Under Control. On the back cover of the CD case, the front line of the riot police stands with their shields, an image that had become too familiar for Brazilians, as mass protests had just, just taken the country by assault, which started as demonstrations against the hike of the bus fare in Sao Paulo. In the lyrics of the homonymous song, Sob Controle, the vocalist Clemente sees the protests of 2013 with a critical gaze, with some suspicion that according to him would materialize itself in the coup d'etat against then the president Dilma Rousseff in 2016. Independently from his political view of those times, the horse vocals of Clemente still tell a similar story to the 1980s film Punks, the film about his generation, made, uh, made uh, uh, many years earlier. After all those decades, the flow of information and bodies it still had buses and music as its mean of transportation. So here is the song by 2013 uh, uh, written uh, by Innocentes. And you can see that it's, uh, the public transportation is everywhere and the city in itself is everywhere. No, I walk through the hot, dirty city and no one sees me. I'm just another one in the crowd who doesn't even know why. Violence is silence, fear is intense, and, and, uh, uh, and silence screams. Faith is blind, the pain is deep, a buzz on fire. Then in the other uh, instance, he continues, from this isolated, futureless, futureless city, I must escape. It's every man for himself, side by side, on public transport. Let's, let's listen to the to part of the song here. It's not, for some reason the sound stopped working. Maybe it turned off. Um, okay. No. No sound. Yeah, because we tested before, no, and it was working. Let me see for my computer. Yes, you can. Can you? Yes, it works. Okay. <laughs> they like the, the music. Yeah. So, as sociologist Angela Alonso proclaimed, June 2013 is a month that has never ended. Just a note, 
this, uh, my book goes from 1996 to 2011. And my first intention was to write about the 2013 protests who are the famous protests in Brazil. But as I decided to write an introductory chapter and this introductory chapter became a book by itself because I found so many sources and so many interesting uh, things going on before those 2013 protests. But those protests in 2013, uh, which started against the hike of the bus fare in Sao Paulo, became a massive mobilization in a matter of weeks. They paralyzed the core urban areas in the country, gather, gathering over a million people and can be considered among the most important mass protests in the history of Brazil. The free fair movement was the main political actor that initiated those demonstrations. The free fair movement's recent origins can be found mainly in, the, in two events, the 2003 bus revolt in the city of Salvador and Florianopolis campaign for the free fair. This campaign would culminate in the so-called turnstile revolt of 2004 and 2005. So here you see some uh, photos. No, to the to the right there is a photo of the 2004 bus uh, turnstile revolt in Florianopolis, and to the left there were two uh, revolt the two photos. There are two photos of the revolts uh, in Salvador. The revolts of Salvador and Florianopolis from 2003 to 2005 were not only a trial at a smaller scale for the subsequent massive uprisings of 2013. They also provide a panorama of the relations between political action and art that would later be repeated with contextual differences nationally. Those earlier protests were closely related to music productions photography and documentary filmmaking. Salvador's buzz revolt, Revolta do Buzu, seems until now to have passed into history with an overwhelming link to cinema rather than music. So here, here you have some stills from a very famous documentary called Revolta do Buzu by Carlos uh, uh, Pronsato. Uh, this documentary served as an instrument of mobilization by the campaign for the free fair in Florianopolis, being shown to students on VHS tapes before the first turnstile revolt, causing a mobilized impact on the viewers. However, punks with their music were also involved in the protests. One of those hardcore punks in Salvador who enthusiastically took part in the bus revolt in the city answers to the name of Robson Veil. Now, uh, at the time, uh, Robson was an acquaintance of Buzz Revolt's filmmaker, Pronsato, and performed as one of the two lead vocalists of the band Lumpen. The group identified itself as revolutionaries who used hardcore as a platform for their political discourse. So here you have two pictures of the band Lumpen when they, when they were in action in the 2000s. And uh, they wrote about themselves. No, I quote, Lumpen is the student who graduated from college and is unemployed, the single mother, the indigenous person who has their culture raped, the black person who has to put up with people saying there is no racism, the broadcasters from the underground radio stations who are persecuted, the bro from the outskirts who has to ride a crowded bus. So you see that, uh, once again, no uh, public transportation is mentioned uh, in their, uh, either in their statements or lyrics. In 2003, the same year of the bus revolt in Salvador, Lumpen song Zona de Processamento para Exportação, Exportation Processing Zone, appeared in a collective CD. In the song, one can clearly identify its left-wing radicalism and anti-capitalist instance mixed with the distorted sounds of electric guitars. So here is uh, another example, you know, this song by Lupin, and you can see that they are very much uh, criticizing uh, consumerism society and capitalist society, you know, and free labor as salvation promises. 
brands, not products. The open, the echoing cry, sugar and water as food. And then in the, the, the other stanza, they say, you buy, you finance, your lifestyle is implanted that. So despite the involvement of punks in the revolt in Salvador, some of them were critical to the outcomes of the protests, even with such an anti-capitalist stance as showing zona de processamento para exportação, or perhaps because of it, Numpen's vocalist Veil had some critical reservations about Salvador's 2003 events that were essentially a struggle for a better and cheaper public service. Now, his criticism was that uh, the protesters wanted a, a, a movement without a leader, but they, were, they did not uh, realize what that meant in uh, reality. Um, here is another photo of Salvador's bus revolt. And basically the tactic of the students were to just go out of the school you no, know, and close an important avenue or street uh, that was uh, close to their schools. So after some time, uh, uh, with many schools doing the same thing, the traffic of the city would collapse. Even though limited in many aspects, the 2003 Revolta do Buzu in Salvador had several implications for democracy, the public sphere, and the general political mobilization in terms of the role of the youth in such matters. After the Revolta do Buzu, a significant number of young people in Brazil realized that they could perform as a de decisive power in the historical course and in the politics of their city and consequently their country. The events in Salvador means that a new generation joined the debates and discussions occurring within a weak democracy. A large part of the students participating in the protests had been born in the years surrounding the proclamation of the 1988 Brazilian constitution, have been raised under formal democratic principles of freedom of thought speech and uh, assembly. They put those principles to test. They sought to break any still existing limitations on the rights of uh, the people. So here you see a map of the city of Salvador and all those points are uh, blockages that were happening during uh, the revolt. You know? So the students would uh, just block uh, streets around uh, those areas, and after a few uh, hours, the, the traffic would just uh, collapse. Uh, Salvador Revolt was essential for the national organization of a general movement for the free fair. There is also a link between the bus revolt in Salvador and the first turnstile revolt. Uh, Revolta da Catraca in Florianópolis the following year. This is a picture of uh, Revolta da Catraca. Um, uh, Manuel Nascimento establishes that, I quote him, Florianópolis had a moment very similar to the Revolta do Buzu and directly inspired by it. For the free fair movement, which would be born in some respects, in Florianópolis, the destruction of the current model of public transportation involved in the main cities of the country should be a step toward the destruction of the capitalist system. The, str the, the struggle for free fair would function as a micro-revolution, which encompasses at a smaller scale the contradictions, difficulties, and lessons of a total revolution. Moreover, unrestricted public transportation for students was considered as part of a package comprising universal education. This is very important. You know? So the free fair movement 
considered uh, that uh, a free fair for students was part of, of universal education. So for them, you couldn't have universal access for, uh, uh, to education without free public transportation for the students. Discussions about the role of education were important in the Brazilian punk scene in general as well. For example, from 2002 to 2008, in the city of Belo Horizonte and later in Sao Paulo, emerged an event called Carnaval Revolução, Revolution Carnival, which passed into history as a sui generis event that mixed art and uh, politics. So here, a flyer of the 2003 uh, Carnaval Revolução. You know, uh, this, uh, um, this event, in fact, had a pedagogical, educational perspective. It could be understood as a critique of what commonly comprised the curricula in schools and universities. It was an attempt to give an alternative or even altogether unprecedented approach to subjects that the organizers and the participants considered neglected by most professional teachers and college instructors. So it was also a criticism to the idea of the university as it was in Brazil at the time. The revolution should encompass the creation of a new mentality without prejudice, prejudices and authoritarian hierarchies. This a reproach of formal education, the necessity of revamping learning processes is reflected in a song by Abuso Sonoro, Sound Abuse, uh, which was performed at Carnaval Revolução Recorded in 2000, it bears the revealing title of Educação Zero, Zero Education. So here is uh, the song by Abuso Sonoro, and you can see in this instance, you know, free schools through education. You know, they are just very critical to the educational system in Brazil. So one interesting thing about this band is that uh, it had a female vo uh, vocalist and singer, who, uh, who, which is actually kind of rare, uh, not uh, unheard of, but rare in, at that time in the hardcore punk scene in Brazil. A new education should emerge, liberating people to fulfill their innate talents and aspirations. Carnaval Revolução in the city of Belo Horizonte function as a kind of summer university for musicians and activists, including, including militants for free public transportation. It is in such a historical context that Carnaval Revolução and the struggle for the free fair in Brazil formed a recognizable alliance. Music had become a career of a carrier of information and the transportation of bodies would allow the circulation of music. It is then important to exemplify the overwhelming diversity of topics addressed by debates and workshops held at Carnaval Revolução. So he's, uh, it's interesting because they had the, the hardcore punk shows and between those shows, they had the lectures and debates. In February, 2006, during the, uh, the Carnaval Revolução event, Besides hardcore punk music, there were debates about indigenous issues, alternative food, open software, and a panel devoted to the free fair struggle that included such topics such as direct action. And during the 2008 Carnaval Revolução, the free fair movement made itself inequivocally present once again through the movement's announced participation in a workshop and a film screening followed by a discussion. In some, Carnaval, in Carnaval Revolução in Belo Horizonte and later in Sao Paulo, one sees the union of education and public transportation with debates that touch on the relationship between culture and urban space. For the free fair activists, 
when the government does not grant students a limited use of city buses, buses, it is in fact reducing access to learning and culture. With such an ideological foundation, in the same decade in Florianopolis, another city, the campaign for the free fair sought contact with and support uh, from the hardcore punk scene because in their view, the people who played in bands and attended the shows of such a music genre were young people who had a greater inclination to engage in direct action. So this is a document from 2004 by the campaign for the free fair in Florianopolis. And here they explain why it's important, or at least they state how it is important to uh, to be uh, to approach hardcore and hip hop groups. You no, know, they say, uh, "Quote the section inside the prefer campaign responsible for art is a bit more complex and extremely important. It consists in establishing contact with artists in the broadest sense who are willing to collaborate with the prefer campaign. It's fundamental to highlight the potential of the music shows." especially those by hardcore punk and hip hop groups for mobilizing aggressive sectors of the youth, which are of interest to us." End of quote. As one can see in this document published by Florianopolis Campaign for the Free Fair, hardcore uh, uh, punk rock music shows were an important part of the activities aiming at promoting and growing the movement. Um, so here is uh, uh, here are some posters uh, of uh, uh, of hardcore and punk rock shows that were related to the free fair movement, to the campaigns against the uh, ri uh, the rise in the bus fares, and uh, they were either organized or by the free fair movement itself, or they were linked uh, with the free fair movement. As one uh, activist and scholar, Yuri Gama, in his account of the hardcore punk environment in Florianopolis, named the key local bands that were playing in the first half of the 2000s and that at the same time were connected to hubs of cultural and political activism. Uh, I quote him Bands that come to mind are Unica Chance, S2888, Guerra de Classes, Eutanasia, Cabeça Armada. Monstro da Garagem and Umber Visions, end of quote. One of those bands that uh, might be of special interest here is S2888, S288. S2888 was a hardcore band of Florianopolis active in the first half of the 2000s. The group chiefly played songs with clear anti-systemic anti content as happens with the piece Consumo Cego. So in this uh, song, you clearly see the uh, criticism to the capitalist as, uh, as, as a person who controls uh, or uh, is in control of society. Let's listen to it. <laughs> S2888, this band, played in at least one event related to the campaign for the free fair in Florianopolis. The guitar player Uriel Oliveira, after leaving S2888 in 2002, went on to be an impor important contributor to Rádio de Troia, Trojan Radio. So here you can see a poster of this radio. It was an underground radio station, and they were covering the protests against the hike of the bus fares the bus fare in Florianópolis. So this poster is from around 2004, uh, 2005. S2888 would later create a video accompanying the song Consumo Cego. One image, this image here, uh, depicts the musicians performing with an invited vocalist who is wearing a t-shirt bearing the emblem of another band from Florianópolis, Guerra de Classes, which means class war. 
Gerhard classes appears to have been an influential, have to have been influential in the underground rock scene of that city and beyond. Apart from Gerhard classes musical impact, Daniel Guimarães and Léo Vinicius, two major figures in the turnstile revolts in the free fair movement itself, are former members of that punk rock band. Guimarães was the de facto, uh, was one of the people uh, uh, de facto responsible for communication and propaganda related to the free fair movement in Florianópolis. And Vinicius wrote the most important accounts of the student revolts against the hike of the bus fair in that same city in 2005 and 2004. So his two books that, that you can see here uh, are named A Guerra da Tarifa, The Fair War, and Vinicius uh, uh, wrote the books and then I, I uh, sent uh, questions to him in which he summarized the activists that originated his, his band, Guerra de Classes. He says, the anarcho-punks of Florianópolis got together every Saturday in a square in the 1990s. I used to go there because I was an anarchist, I, I was an anarchist and they were anarchists. From our interactions, we started a band in the second half of, in the second semester of 1996, which we called Impio, the Impious. In the beginning of 1997, we can say that this band became Guerra de Classes. Guimarães, by his turn, would become the best player of Guerra de Classes from 1998. Later, he would also become closely linked with the protests related to public transportation. He occupied such a significant role in the struggle for the free fair that, during the turnstile revolt of 2005, a text written by him and made available on the Independent Media Center's website was seen by the police as the starting point of the convolution that would take over the city. Guerra de Classes remains remarkable for having in its lyrics one of the most politically revolutionary discourses of the bands in any way linked with the free fair movement, as is the case with Povo in Armas. Uh, uh, people in arms. As you can see, no, it's a, it's a very anarchist uh, lyrics. Uh, uh, they say, you know, we don't need leaders saying we must fight. We don't need orders saying we must act. We don't need to elect anyone to supply our needs and so on and so on. Let's listen to, to part of it. <laughs> Just one thing that uh, uh, I like about this song is that in the line, in the third stanza, you know, we are, uh, uh, we don't fear ruins as we carry the world in our hearts. This is a quotation uh, from a uh, Spanish anarchist, Buenaventura Duruti, who fought in the Spanish Civil War. So actually they were very much influenced by uh, anarchist thought. They were reading it and citing it. And as you know, the, the, the uh, Spanish anarchism was very influential in the 20th century. Uh, it's clear from this example that in Guerra de Classes, political engagement stands unmistakably as part of the Brazilian band's ethos. Guimarães later provide a glimpse of their militant landscape. 
So uh, they, he says, no code. In the end of the 1990s and early 2000s, those people around me began getting involved in activism too. There was a very strong influence of Zapatismo. We started to do things like the free radio, community radio movement. So they were also influenced, uh, besides Spanish anarchists, they were influenced by the Zapatistas or Neo Zapatists uh, in Mexico. You can see to the right, there's a song called Viva Zapata, and there's the photo of Subcomandante uh, Marcos. One of the most important radio stations that emerged from this process was, in fact, Radio de Troia. Radio de Troia would later give rise to the chapter of the Independent Media Center in Florianópolis, which became the de facto news and mobilization website for the Free Fair movement in that city. According to Gama, quote, the Independent Media Center in Florianópolis emerged in 2004, more or less from folks who were already at Rádio de Troia, end of quote. But the relationship does not stop there. The same post office box number used by the punk band Guerra de Classics in the 1990s was used again in the 2000s by Florianópolis website Independent Media Center. By discovering the organization that occupied that the organizations that occupied that particular post off box number throughout the years, we can say that a punk rock band such as Guerra de Classes function as a type of ideological embryo of the independent media center of Florianopolis, which was intrinsically connected to the Free Fair movement. So actually, most of the documents from my research comes from the, the from an archived version of the uh, independent media center website. So I used my computer to download all the files from this website. It was more than 100,000 files. And each file is basically a news piece about a social movement, a protest, or, uh, or, a, or an event, a political event, and many of them related to the uh, uh, Free Fair movement. Now, in fact, I download uh, more than 100,000 files from the Internet Archive server hosting a mirrored version of the Independent Media Center's website, a work of digital cyber archaeologic excavation. So I call this digital archaeology. Uh, this uh, digital archaeologic dig allowed me to retrieve numerous documents made by the activists of the campaign for the Free Fair and the Free Fair Youth the Free Fair Movement. Yeah, the classes then help give birth to a communication, a lineage, or a succession of linked ideas that traveled through several political and music groups from the 1990s to the 2010s. The band Guerra de Classes, Rádio de Troia, the Independent Media Center of Florianópolis, and the Free Fair Movement can be seen as helping in the development of each other and in the creation of sister endeavors. Um, this accumulated experience would grow year by year and from Florianópolis to other cities in Brazil, mainly in Sao Paulo. So going to Sao Paulo now, in, June of 2000, in July of 2005, the 13th Sao Paulo Hardcore Festival took place. And besides the music shows, it included a discussion about nothing less than the free fair struggle. The Sao Paulo Hardcore Festival was organized by Verdurada Collective, following the ideas of the straight edge punk community. Straight edge punks are known for listening to hardcore, for listening to hardcore punk music and for abstaining for the, from the consumption of tobacco, alcoholic beverage, and drugs. They are also uh, often vegetarians or vegans. You know, Felipe Madureira, who authored this specific poster that you can see here, stated, quote, we knew that much repression was going on in Florianópolis and we were kind of solidary, we, we, we were kind of in solidarity with the people who went through that. In this poster, there were the little buses from Sex Pistols, the police are there defending private interests. Uh, transportation, although part of it being public, much of it is controlled by the private sector. And we know that police uh, protect capital, end of quote. 
The link between the Verdurada hardcore punk event and the discussion about the democratization of transportation within the city were further strengthened throughout the years. According to Luca Legumi, uh, Lucas Legumi Oliveira, the free fair movement took advantage of the shows, the music shows, to sell its political oriented merchandise and even sometimes receive monetary help from the Verdurada collective. Another example, uh, at the beginning of January 2011, the same Verdurada Collective organized in Sao Paulo the two-day 18th Sao Paulo Hardcore Festival. In between the shows, there was a lecture by Pedalinas, a feminist collective engaged in making, in making it possible for female bicyclists, bicyclists to pedal more safely around the city. Pedalinas shared the stage with several bands, including one called Violator. Violator was a trash metal band from the city of Brasilia that recorded a piece of extremely significance to the struggle against cars. In their repertoire, there is a work called Apocalypse Engine. So this is the quote by Felipe Madureira. This is the poster of, uh, of the event in which the feminist group Pedalinas uh, participated you know, uh, to uh, foster uh, uh, the, that more women use bikes to, uh, to travel through the city. And here is a Violator Apocalypse Engine. And this is interesting because this song is based, this song is based on a book called Apocalypse Motorizado. You know? And uh, this book was translated into Portuguese by Léo Vinicius. Léo Vinicius, you remember, is the same one who wrote the books about the turnstile revolts in Florianópolis. So let's listen to this uh, song by Violators, no part of the song. <laughs> So going to uh, the end of the presentation, no? after generous event with the women's cycling collective Pedalinas at the band Violator, another round of music shows were organized by Verdurada in June 2011. This time, the Free Fair movement occupied the position of special guest and a discussion about the movement's activities enjoyed a central place. A punk who attended the activities wrote the following about that day, quote, the folks from the Free Fair movement take the stage in order to conduct a very cool lecture about the struggle against the hikes of the fair and the new combat flag of the movement, the mobilization for the zero fair. The zero fair is based on the following plausible argument. If public schools and hospitals are free, why not transportation too? The zero fare, no end of quote, the zero fare for the entire population would mean for the free fare movement to go beyond the struggle against hikes and the free fare for students, their main demographic. This would mean the destruction of, or the obsolescence of the turnstiles that exist inside buses in Brazil, which force users to pay for the fare. Flora Lorena Miller, a Florianopolis militant, once wrote, quote, the struggle against turnstiles is the struggle for the right to the city, end of quote. The movement had, choos had chosen an object that unquestionably had to be eliminated, 
Western styles exemplify the worst characteristics of a transportation system that was the focus of the militants' fight. Throughout the country, the burning turnstile would become the iconic image, the representational metaphor of the campaign for unrestricted access to the city. Within this campaign, the punk culture became particularly present in the cathartic moment of destruction of these metal barriers. Punk made itself visible as the provider of bodies to carry out the execution of an anarchic ritual. In Sao Paulo, turnstiles, turnstiles were ignited with the support and active vigor of people who identified with the punk movement. There, they would become the front line of the attack. In Brazil, the turnstile is a mechanical obstruction through which money is collected in exchange for mobilized mobility. At the same time, the turnstile represent the, represents the administrative bodies of the government. As a result, the attack on the, the turnstile becomes an attack on the state. So here, uh, this is the photo that is the cover of the book. And you can see that they are burning a turnstile. And this person here is a punk. You no, know, he is written here in his jack on his jacket, Era Punk, which is a salute uh, between punks in Brazil. And here you see uh, a logo of the Japanese band Disclose. There is another punk there with, I don't know if you can see that, with a, 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 a t shirt of the band The Exploited. And there is another one uh, that is filming as well with a, a, a T-shirt of the dead Kennedys. Um, so you can see that they were around there burning the turnstile. In a 2007 letter signed by the Plutonopolis chapter of the Free Fair Movement and retrieved by Yuri Gama through his academic work, we can understand that the burning of turnstiles in cases where it evolves to reach its full potential of destroying all forms of access limitations to public transportation is consider considered a revolutionary act by the movement. The movement says, or said in 2007, historically, the organization of the circulation of the poor population in cities had always been based on very clear class criteria, which impeded the lower classes from, from fully using the urban space in its public services. This means that the act of freeing public transportation from turnstiles takes the shape of a historical revolutionary measure." End of quote. To put an end to the existence of turnstile is among the first steps, is, a, is among the first steps of a revolution. This reasoning can have only one logical outcome. Institutions are not safe from the fire that emerges from the movement. This fury can be spread from the turnstile to other impediments or state bodies that need to be destroyed through revolution. It is a trigger for much more larger achievements on the path of social equality. So here you can see them burning another turnstile in front of the building who, uh, that houses the Secretary of Municipal Transportation of Sao Paulo. And the one interesting, one of the interesting things about the book is that the PDF of the book is freely available. So you can just download it. Uh, there is no need to buy the book. It's free for everyone. Here you have a Q code and the web address. Thank you very much. Do people want to come in and sit down? Did that help? No? <laughs> okay, up to you. Um, I thought that was wonderful. So basically my job now is to try and moderate some discussion, but I'm going to kick it off by asking a contextual question. So when I think back to the punk movement in the UK, mm -hmm. you know, coming from kind of anarchism, it was anti-education, anti-monarchy, anti-state, anti-everything. So what really excites me, and I'm quite interested in this particular context, is how anarchism and a fight for democratization around free transport and stuff like that comes together. Yeah. And why in the Brazilian context? 
Well, it's very interesting. Thanks for the question. Because the, the, actually, the, the, the punk movement in Brazil starts in the end of the 1970s and the beginning of the 1980s, mainly in Sao Paulo. And that is the time, you no know, Lula just won the election. That's the time where the great strikes from the metal workers happened in Brazil. That's when, when Lula became a political figure as well. So actually the, the Brazilian punks were not that much anarchists, you no, know, because for example, they voted for the workers' party. You, know, you, can, you can find photo of photos online there of them in, in, in demonstrations together with the people from the workers' uh, party. So the, the punk movement in Brazil had uh, a low, uh, 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 my daughter here, she had a low, uh, they had a, a low moment in the, uh, uh, in the 1980s and in the 2000s, they uh, became, uh, in the 1990s and the 2000s, they became very powerful again, especially the hardcore punk scene. And these people also, many bands were not, did not consider themselves uh, anarchists. They consider themselves communists, socialists. So in my book, I use the term anti-capitalist. I say that's the, the, mo the most, uh, or the, the, the best term to, that, that incorporates all the ideologies that were going on in the hardcore uh, punk scene uh, in Brazil. So that helped them to have a connection with this movement for free public transportation, because this movement were basically started by Trotskyists uh, who uh, broke with the, uh, 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 with the workers' party because they were the youth of the workers' party and they didn't want to be uh, told what to do by uh, the, the older people from the party. So they decided to create their own organization. So they were like Trotskyists, like becoming anarchists and they were like anarchists becoming more like communists. There were like a crossover. Yeah. Now we talk a lot about a crossover in music, you know, between crossover like Violator, you know, with trash metal, it's a crossover with hardcore, metal, but there were like a crossover in political terms as well between anarchism and communism uh, in this generation in Brazil. Yeah, I think that's just fascinating. So mm -hmm. in the UK context, there's none of that because it was almost like, I mean, you use this phrase, um, they felt they were like rejected children in modernism and kind of abandoned in utopia. I mean, yeah. I think it's wonderful and I think the British punk scene did that as well. Yeah. But they felt there was no future, there was no way out. Whereas here, it seems like there is a forward looking trajectory and there is a sense that there are ways out through particular actions. And I think that that's really very different. Yes. Really quite interesting. I think that's very particular to the case of Brazil. Another thing that's very particular as well is that the bands lasted for many, many years. You know? So we, have bands, we still have bands from the 1980s that still, uh, uh, play today in yes. Brazil. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else like to ask any questions? Or make any comments? Mm. Must do audience Q and A during the reception as well. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Would you rather do that and mingle? So we have or, a reception laid out just in the room next door with drinks and nibbles and stuff. Yes. I saw one hand. No. Right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. I can't yes. I was just wondering if you could tell us a little more about your cyber archaeology. How did this book like for research? I, yeah, yes. I, 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 yes, though no, this was very because uh, my my idea in the end I did interviews as well, but my 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 like my first idea was to write based on things that I could found uh, I could find in the internet. So I, I was actually, I had this in my mind, if I, I, I could be able to tell the, the, uh, this, the, tell the story of my generation, basically, you know, because 1995, I was born in 1982, so I was 13 
when the internet arrived in Brazil. So these people are more or less from the same age or younger. So we are like the first users of the internet in Brazil. So I was trying to see if I could tell the story of this generation through internet. In the end, I, I, I did interviews, but I realized that uh, the websites were gone. The websites from the 1990s, the early 2000s were gone. And I, as I started uh, writing the book, more and more websites started to disappear. So that called my attention. You know? So uh, for almost like a miracle, the internet archive uh, really uh, archived because sometimes the internet archive works well, sometimes not, but for the independent media center, it worked really well. So they archived most of the website, but the website was huge because the website was running for like 10, 15 years. So I found this script that do exactly that, an excavation in the internet archive and download everything from a, a domain. So this uh, script download, like my computer was running for a few days and it, it download like 150,000 files. And each file is a news piece basically, you know? Each file is a news piece about. So from that, from that I was able to index everything because in the internet archive, you cannot do, you cannot do a, a search like in Google. You know? So I was able in my computer to index and to start to search that with keywords like prefer movement, uh, things like that. And then I was able to retrieve the news piece about uh, about the free fair movement. And then it was my first chapters precisely I'm discussing the how how the internet is is very uh, good and at the same time it's an evil because you have all those many websites that were lost uh, and you have many things that just disappeared and you don't have access anymore. You know, it's, uh, but basically that's the, idea behind cyber archaeology, to this idea of digital archaeology in the internet archive, you know, to see what you can get. And if you look at the reference of, of my book, you see most of the things come from the internet archive. So without this, without this, uh, this, this archive, it would be impossible to write the book the way it is. You know? Amazing. Brilliant. I think we probably should go have drinks and snacks and have a chat. But... I would like to thank Rodrigo. I thought that was absolutely fascinating. Thank you.